All right, and we are live. Welcome in, everybody. My name is Dennis the Professor. Ooh, the chalk feels so good today. Dennis the Professor. And today, we'll be talking about entrepreneurship. entrepreneurship and in particular we'll be covering human resources human resources and location planning so these are actually going to be pretty important to when you're founding your business Right, And the reason they're going to be important is human resources as a whole uh, is going to be the majority of your business, right? The people that run your business, the people that are active in your business are going to be important. They're going to be making decisions, they're going to be making connections, you're going to be the ones speaking to your client, representing your brand, right? And your location is actually going to have a great deal of influence and we're going to learn about how to choose a location and why choosing one location over another might make more sense for your business in particular. So let's begin with the human resource plan. Right? You need to have a plan for your human resources. You need to understand what you're going to do, who you're going to hire, what positions you're looking to fill, and most importantly you're going to be thinking about why you want to fill those positions. Right? So when you think of the word entrepreneur, what comes to mind, right? So feel free to put that in the chat. Um, I'll give it about 10, 15 seconds, and then I'll move on, and we'll, we'll do this kind of back and forth interaction uh, from now on, just so you feel more involved in the chat, and I'm able to work more with your skill level and, and understand what you're looking for to, or what you're looking to get out of this class. If you're watching the class on YouTube, no problem. Go ahead and put it in the comments, or just jot it down on a piece of paper. You'll be able to follow along with what you're doing and we'll be able to build on the knowledge you already have and you'll be able to see some of the flaws and then all of the things that you write during this class, you'll be able to incorporate both into your business and into a business plan. So, when you think of the word entrepreneur, right? You probably think of people like Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Right? You might think of someone like Mark Zuckerberg. Right? And it's true that they are all entrepreneurs. Right? But this kind of thinking can lead you astray. And the reason it can lead you astray is for the following reason. Right? There's a couple of things all these people have in common. Right? First of all, their first name is four letters. Okay, your first name doesn't have to be four letters in order for you to be a successful entrepreneur. That's very important to remember. The second thing is that we think of one person. We think of just Bill Gates. We think of just Elon Musk. We think of just Mark Zuckerberg. But the truth is, your success in business is going to depend on a team of people, right? And more often than not, requires a team of people in order to be successful. Whether or not those people are people that you hire or people that you work with outside your organization in an alliance kind of arrangement, right? And we'll talk about how to make those kinds of arrangements. So that's the first thing, right? The second thing that's kind of interesting about these people is they're all wildly successful, right? We, we hear kind of the most successful, the most successful, but the truth is the majority of the time, it's not like this, right? The majority of the time, their entrepreneurs are not super successful and they don't have to be. Right? They don't have to be. Success to you and success to Bill Gates are two different things. And perhaps you find an idea just as powerful as the one Mark Zuckerberg found in Facebook. right? Or perhaps you have a smaller idea and that small idea is able to enable you to be happy. right? To do something fulfilling with your life. And so you're going to depend, regardless of what you do, you're going to depend on collaboration. And collaboration is going to be the key to your business, 
So one of the things that's important in human resources, how do you get the people that you need? Right? So first you're gonna we're gonna think about together what kind of people you need for your company, right? What kind of people do you need to be successful? What kind of people do you need to collaborate with? What kind of businesses, right? What kind of government entities? And then we're gonna think about how do you get access to those people and how do you get access to the best of those people, right? Because just needing an engineer is great, right? But obviously you'd rather have a better engineer than a worse engineer. And just needing a doctor or just needing some legal minds is also good, but you're gonna want access to kind of the best that you can get and the person you can trust. That's also an important factor. And so, in general, team ventures, as we'll find in our research, team ventures outperform solo people, right? So if you're a lone wolf and, and you want to go out and build your own company by yourself, that's fine, right? I'm not saying this is the worst way, but team ventures do tend to outperform. And the reason they outperform is that two people usually have more skills than just one person. Right? And we'll look at how you select people that not only complement your skills, but may complement your personality type. Right? May complement the way you do business or the way you think about things. And so what we'll go through is we'll go through building a management team. Right? How do you build the people that you're going to surround yourself in the business? How do you get to them? Right? We're going to talk about how you form an organization. And some of that is going to be not only informed by your needs, but it's going to be informed by the way you structure incentives, by the amount of risk you're willing to take, both personal and professional, right? By the type of business that you're in and the type of professional that you are. We're also going to talk about strategic alliances. Strategic alliances. These are going to be people or businesses that are not necessarily your employees, that are not necessarily working just for your company, right? But that, you can create some kind of mutual benefit, a win-win situation, in order for both of you to succeed and thrive in the business world. Right? We're going to find that this is actually extremely common. And then we're going to finally talk about a board of directors. And we're going to talk about the role that the board of directors serves. Right? and how involved they tend to be, and then what to look for in a board of directors. And attracting a successful board of directors can really make or break a business. As a matter of fact, any of these things, if done wrong, can ruin a business. A fantastic idea, if any of these things are done wrong, nothing will work. However, if done right, and if the idea is good, your chances of success increase astronomically. So it's important to learn how we're going to approach these pieces. So let's first talk about let's first talk about building a management team. Building a management team. Right, so we're gonna talk about building a management team and the right way to do that. So the first thing to define is going to be what kind of people belong in management, right? Who is defined as management? Is, is the guy that cleans the facilities management, right? Is your cousin management who sometimes looks at your paperwork and says if it's good or not, right? So a management team, anybody on the management team is going to play a key role in your business. Play a key role, whether that's a lead developer, or even your lawyer. If that person is playing a key role in your business, you should consider them as part of your management team. So take a minute now and write down the most important parts of your business. Important parts of business. So while you do that, Right? Assuming you want to start a business or assuming you have some business idea. I'm going to go ahead and do that for this street. Right? So some of the things we want to worry about is quality for the stream. Right? The next thing we want to worry about is depth. We also want to worry about reach and funding. Right? 
So in quality, in quality, I might want to go out and look for someone that knows how to set up video equipment, how to set up sound equipment, how to make things flow smoothly, right? How to live, how to change screen images and overlay things live, right? I might look for a few people that are going to help me interact with the chat, that are going to help answer questions or filter them out. I might look for software that can do this for me. For depth, I might look to expand my offering, right? So the first thing I might do is I might involve more people, right? Which means I need to write my lessons differently. I might look to change the material that I do and expand and say not only offer business courses, but also offer psychology courses or philosophy courses or mathematics courses, right? Courses that will help other people and so allow people, right? So in depth, I have a measurable piece and my measurable piece perhaps is your retention, right? How useful you found the material. Were you able to apply it? How much of it you remember in a week, or two weeks, right? The next thing is reach. So I might look for someone that's a marketing expert. Right? I might do this at first on my own and reach out to different groups and subdivisions of people that try to learn on their own. Right, People that are autodidactic in nature, people that can't afford to go to college but still want to learn, people that are in college and need review or a different perspective, and people that generally have terrible professors that only talk right, and don't listen. And then finally, I might look for someone that is an expert on fundraising, right? that is an expert on contacting organizations and asking them for funding that is an expert on applying for grants, right? And so all of these people would comprise my management team, right? So by now, you should have your own management team written out based on the important parts of your business, right? They don't need to be actual names yet. They don't need to be actual names. And you can think about, to make the situation easier, you can think about in a perfect world, right? So let's say that you have an idea to build a rocket company, okay? So if you wanna build a rocket company, Maybe the perfect person for your board would be Elon Musk. Now, is it likely that you're going to get Elon Musk to get to, to be on your board? Probably not, right? But is it likely that you can find someone with some attributes that are similar, some experiences that are similar to Elon Musk? Absolutely. Absolutely you can, right? Another thing is I'm, I'm in a new industry personally, right? Streaming. So I might actually want to find someone that's been streaming for some time so that I can gain advice, right? So... Excuse me, so that's what I'm looking for in the group, right? What you'll find is that investors also prefer teams. Investors prefer teams. And that's because having seen a lot of ventures on their own, what they found is that people don't necessarily succeed on their own because they don't have the depth of skill. And when things start ramping up, it's very difficult to duplicate a person over and over and over again. And so they have trouble expanding. They have trouble trusting. They have trouble changing into different things. And that doesn't mean that, you know, if you're not going out to seek investors, you really shouldn't worry about their opinions. But if you plan on going out to seek investors, if you're going to scale your business, if it needs financial injections, then you should think about the investor perception, right? Also, you're going to want to worry about a diversity of talent. So for example, notice that on my team, when I worried about depth, I worried about expanding the amount of, the amount of curriculum that we offer, right? In that worry, I would be choosing people that are probably similar or better than myself at teaching, right? Except in different subjects. And that's lateral, right? And that doesn't diversify my talent enough, right? So instead, I need people that aren't necessarily teachers but that are able to do video equipment, that are able to do software, that are able to do editing, that are able to develop websites, right? Whatever it is that I need, it brings diversity because I don't have those skill sets. And you have to be very conscious and very honest with yourself about the skill sets that you don't have for your business, right? Sometimes you're going to have all the skill sets for your business, but that's not always the case. A lot of times you won't. And when you don't, you need to reach out and you need to get to people that do. The next thing to remember is that the answers to these questions are unique. And what that means is the following. Your business has a specific plan. It has a specific vision and it has specific needs. Does everyone need a dozen software engineers? No. 
right? Does your business necessarily need someone that's a great videographer? No. Or someone that does lighting or sound? No, not at all, right? As a matter of fact, if those are small components of your business, you may just want to take a short course or read a tutorial and get it that way. So the answers to these questions are going to be unique to your business. And that's why it's important that when you follow along, you're doing these short exercises and responses so that you're understanding how this affects you in particular. Because I can't lecture to you in particular about the business. What I can do is I can give you the broad strokes and the tools to narrow it down to what you need. Right, so besides that, it's important not to replicate. Don't replicate. So when you're looking for someone that is going to be working with you on a business, if you have a certain skill set, for example, you're a talented software engineer and you're trying to build software that you think IBM would find very interesting and pay a lot of money for, right? For example. Now, you may just need more software engineers, but if you do, try to find someone that isn't, ha doesn't have the exact same background as you do, right? If you and them went to the same school, work at the same job afterwards in the same role, were exposed to the same things over time, and few people are going to be like that, right? But you get kind of get my drift. You don't want someone that's going to think about problems just like you, right? As a matter of fact, a lot of times it's important to find someone that's going to think about problems very differently than how you're thinking about them. Yes, absolutely. See, I'm sorry, so, so skull crusher for life, you're absolutely right, right? Don't replicate. And if you don't need somebody full time, don't overspend your resources, right? So if you go and you show up and you need a software engineer and you need a project made, pay for the project. Pay for the project. Yes, if you do a project all the time, it'll end up cheaper to hire them. But if you're not doing projects all the time, don't do it, right? So this is something I ran into with my company neighbor, right? So when I started Neighbor, I needed to get a lock developed, right? So I needed a prototype for a lock. And my prototype for the lock ended up needing a prototype engineer. I don't happen to be an engineer. As you can see, none of these things are about engineering, right? So I went out and I found a friend who had majored in engineering and who was now a prototype engineer. And I paid to have a design put together, right? And then I went to a laboratory and I actually had it 3D printed um, in order to test out the design and see how it worked and see if I liked it, right? But you contract out if you can, right? So if you only need a little bit of expertise, right? You can think about it in terms of the stream as well, right? So if I want to talk to somebody about setting up professional lighting in, in the room where I film, I'm not going to hire a full-time lighting person. I'm not sitting up, setting up hundreds of these rooms a year. I'm setting up one room once, right? More than likely, I won't need to do it many times. So I'm going to pay for it once. And so I'm going to get a contractor. So that's absolutely a fantastic point, and I'm glad you mentioned it. That brings us to our, to our next point. Remember that there is a difference. And let me, let me erase the board here, because it's getting a little low for me to write. But remember that there are both outside and inside specialists. So what you don't want to do, right, if you're hiring inside specialists, if you're hiring people that work at your company, hire them full time. If you're hiring outside specialists, hire them part time, right? Now there will be people that may be very enthusiastic about your idea, right? They're very excited and they're outside specialists. That doesn't mean you can go to them and say, well, you like my idea, right? Why don't you do it for free, right? Because the reality is you charge for your work. Everyone charges for the work that they do. And the people that are very good at their work charge for their work, right? So when you pay for someone's work, when you pay for an outside specialist's work, when you decide that, hey, I'm going to contract this person, remember that even if I set up the lighting in here professionally once, I may change rooms. I may change my setup. I may change to a different color board. And so those may require lighting adjustments, right? And so you'll be going back to these people over and over and over again. So remember that you're building a relationship. And a lot of times fair compensation is a part of that relationship because that person may give you a favor the first time, but they may be reluctant to come back the second time because they know they might not get paid and they have other priorities, 
right? So prioritize your business and budget for using outside specialists because you're going to need them regardless of what you do. So how do you find these people? How do you find your outside and inside specialists and all of that, right? So I'll give you kind of the boiler, boilerplate, an, boilerplate answer and that's expand your network. Expand your network. And that means the following. That doesn't mean that today, well, it could mean two things, right? You could do this broadly, and you could look do this in a targeted way. So when you do this broadly, you could go to a conference, right? So do me a quick favor here, just write down a couple names of five people, or think about them, right? That can give you things like work, advice, guidance, funding, experience, and connections, right? Think about those people and how you can use them in order and entice them to be a part of your business. Because yes, your business idea may be very exciting to you, and it may be very exciting to everyone in your industry, right? But as someone that does marketing, for example, or teaching, it might not be as interesting to me. And so I would need to be enticed and think about how you're going to do that, how you're going to entice me, right? It doesn't always mean upfront payment. You may be building a service that I can use in the future and I may get access to it, right? You may decide that you want it on a long-term long basis, right? And then write down, so more than likely, you don't have every single one of those people available to you, right? More than likely you don't. And so write down two ways that you can get them, right? And the two ways, broadly speaking, are either broadly or targeted, right? So broadly, when you look for someone, think about think about your networking career. Now, networking has this really negative connotation, this truly negative connotation, and it's it makes a lot of people uncomfortable because it feels a little sleazy, right? You show up to a place and you're just meeting them because you want to meet them, right? And that's a little different if you're doing something in your field or in your industry. Right? So you're not showing up to a marketing meeting and saying, hey, well, I just need a guy to come do some marketing for me for free. That's not really fair. Right? If you are going to an industry meeting for, say, software engineers, there may be some marketers there. And you may meet them and you may say, hey, let me keep in touch. There may be some other software engineers that have built a business. Right? And so you may want to get in touch with them and ask them, hey, who are you connected to? But remember, the people that you meet, the relationships that you have, can prove to be interesting and exciting and full of potential in the future, right? So you can speak to them today and say, hey, you know, this is great and I love your business idea, let's keep in touch. And you might keep in touch with them for two, three, four, five years. And I'm not saying text them every single day, right? Shoot them an email once a year, shoot them an email if you go to their website and there's some update about their business or you see something on LinkedIn or Facebook about it or you spot one of their ads, right? And say, hey, I just got your ad, just wanted to check in how the business is doing, see how it's all going, and so on and so forth. Down the line, you may be able to speak to those people on getting introductions, and those people will be a lot warmer about introducing you because they've gotten to know you over that time, right? When you're looking in a targeted way, you're usually looking for specific skills or services, right? Now, one of the worst ways to do this, perhaps not the worst way, but one of the worst ways, is to get on Google and see what the top 10 search results are for contract software engineers, okay? The reality is you're not going to find the people that are aligned with your business that way, and you're not going to find people that you can immediately trust. You're going to have to build trust over time. So what you can do is by looking in a targeted way, one of the ways that I've done this is by looking for Second connections on LinkedIn, right? By looking for second connections on LinkedIn. Now, you can do this right away, or you can go ahead and ask your friends. Ask your friends because their social groups will resemble yours to a degree, right? You won't have all the same friends. They might know someone else from a different college or from a different high school or from a different job and they might be able to introduce you or from a different project, right? 
And so ask around. This is the better targeted way of finding the people that you need. It's going to take a little bit longer and you're not going to have access to the number one software developing company in the world, but that's not the company you want access to. What you want access to is you want access to people that you can trust. Right. And so this idea, whether or not you're going into business today or you're going into business in five years or you have a business idea that you're going to one day use, right? Oh, hey, welcome Uncle Bill Druin. Um, regardless, what you should be doing is you should be building social capital. Building social capital. And this is just a very businessy way of saying you should go out and do good things, right? We don't always need a direct benefit to ourselves, but however, we are, for the most part, rather selfish human beings, right? And so think about what you can do in order to build social capital. So perhaps you can help volunteer and tutor some kids at your local college, right? And what you might find is you walk into people from different walks of life doing the same thing, also building social capital. And so you'll have a base to work with them from, right? You can do other similar things besides volunteering. You can work on nonprofit projects, right? You can go and just meet with people in general and see how you can get involved in things that they're having trouble with or anything like that. You can offer your services at a discounted fee for certain people that are just starting up, right? You can offer advice or you can offer courses, right? Whatever it is that you do, remember that it's okay to have a selfish reason to do something good. The reality is you're still doing something good, right? Don't do it with just this intention. So I'm gonna go volunteer just so I can meet people because you'll be disappointed if you don't, right? But know that by doing good, you can bring good back into your network and you can meet people that are going to be helpful. If you're looking for cheap labor, take a course at your local community college that's related to your need and hire the smartest person in the class. If it's you, you'll have a project to ask questions to the professor to figure out your project. At the very least, become friends with local professors. They're usually happy to recommend students and students are looking for work experience. Skull Crusher, that is a fantastic point. That is a fantastic point. Go out. Go out to where people meet. Go out to where people learn, right? At the very least, you'll pick up some new skills. At the very least, you'll pick up some new skills. And most of the time, those courses at community colleges are actually very inexpensive and very reasonable considering the value that you're getting. And you're going to meet people on campus. You're going to meet like-minded people at the school. You're going to meet professors that have vast networks of not only people in the industry that they've worked with for a very long time, but also students, like you said, that are looking for work experience, that have certain skills that are looking to apply. Another place to look at is incubators, right? There's a lot of tech incubators, one of them actually located at Queens College, um, where I teach, where startups will come in and then what they'll have is they'll have students from different departments come in and volunteer to work there on startups, right? So you could look at getting involved in different ways to bring in labor, but remember, it's not always that you get what you pay for, right? It's not always that sometimes you can get a great bargain, right? But remember to reward the people in some way that are working for you and working for your business. These people are devoting time to building something that you believe in, that they may believe in as well, but that you have founded, right? That you ultimately own. And when you're meeting with these people, make sure that you find out what it is they're trying to get out of the project? Are they trying to build a portfolio? Do they need a recommendation for a future job? And make sure you give that to them because that can be extremely valuable and that could bring those people back to you in the future when you might need them full time or for more work. So the next thing you're gonna wanna do after building a management team, right? So you've identified who you needed and hopefully you've gone out and you've enticed the people to go and get it, right? So one of the worst ways to start building relationships with people is to put in non-disclosure agreements and all of these lengthy legal forms and say, well, I'll only tell you about my idea if you meet with my lawyer and ride the elevator up and down six times and then squat and flip the light switch, right? Like, don't overdo it. 
don't overdo it. Just have a conversation with the person and that'll be fine, right? That'll be absolutely fine. So the next thing you're gonna wanna do after you start or after you've built your management team, at least on paper, at least on paper, is you're going to want to understand what is going to be the legal form of your organization, right? What is going to be the legal form of your organization, right? And so you've probably heard of a few of these. I recall a certain electronics company that began with three students in electronics engineering of a local community college in a garage repairing CATVs it was a national concern within eight years. Absolutely, absolutely, right? That's extremely, that's, that's, I mean, that's a success story, but a lot of companies start with people that are just putting in the sweat equity, so to speak. That's one of the hardest parts. You're so proud of your idea, think it's going to make you rich and don't want to give the idea away to someone you fundamentally don't know. Yeah, um, so I discussed this a little earlier and let me, let me just take an aside, right? Success is here, right? And success is you define it, making you rich or whatever it is. And your idea is here, right? This in between piece is 99%. Getting it built, marketing it, putting it in front of the right people, finding the right team, putting together a business plan, raising money, running the company day to day, putting in the hours, sacrificing the pay, all of that goes into here. Most people are not going to be doing this. And that's why most people don't start businesses. That's why most people will take an hourly wage and they're happy with doing it because they're not willing to go through this process. It bears an extremely hard amount of work of risk and so on and so forth. And so when sharing your idea, unless you're sharing it with someone that is a serial entrepreneur and has a reputation for stealing ideas, right? You're pretty much safe, right? You're pretty much safe in this scenario because someone not only has to take your idea, right? But also understand your entire vision because your idea is very rarely your vision, right? Um, so I wanna build an educational stream. Great, okay, that's a great idea you don't know my vision in the long run. And so somebody might take my idea, and I would be actually really happy if someone did take my idea and did this for more educational subjects. But let's say I wasn't, and let's say I was very protective of it. Someone would have to put in all of this work, right? Necessarily for, you know, basically expending your own time to do it and thinking about it and planning and so on and so forth, just to get to a probability of success, a chance not even guaranteed. So you're very much safe when sharing your ideas. And what you may find is by sharing your ideas, you'll find customers. You'll get input, right? As a matter of fact, the people that are going to be most helpful are those that give you criticism. You'll identify your target market. Right? And you might find help. You might say to someone, hey, I'm building an educational stream. Okay, great. Well, it's not for me, but you know what? I've got a friend that's very involved in education and they do consulting on a part-time basis. Let me, let me see if I can talk to them and introduce you guys, right? And these are actually so much more likely. So think about it this way. Every time you don't share your idea, the opportunity cost is the chance of getting all of this. Every time you share your idea, there is a minimal risk, and I'm talking about like one in a hundred thousand of someone else achieving success before you, right? The reality is people are going to compete with you regardless of what your idea is. The second it's out there, someone is gonna to try to duplicate it, right? Your work ethic and your ability to guide the idea and your ability to run a business and hire the right people and structure everything the right way and respond to things nimbly is going to lead to success, not just your idea. Yeah, absolutely, Skull Crusher. I agree. Most people do think that the idea is 50%. As a matter of fact, I, I've seen people so obsessed with not sharing their idea 
only to start sharing it when it's already done by someone else, right? So I had a good friend that had an idea for Easy Pass, never told anybody his whole life, decided he was going to pursue it one day. Now everybody's got Easy Pass, right? Um, I had a friend who had a great idea for a cab service that you could hail with your phone, right? Never told anybody, never got any feedback, never got started because of that, because he never saw other people's excitement. He never saw that other people might be interested. And now Uber's a thing. And now he goes around telling everybody, well, I had this idea, I had the idea for Uber 15 years ago, and that's great. That's great. That's great. Except you still have a regular job, and the Uber guys are, are filthy rich, right? And in some legal trouble, but filthy rich, right? So... You know, it's tough It's tough to get over that hump, but it's going to be important for your success. Uh, do I happen to have a section or a day on patents? Uh, I will have to look at my notes. I will have to look at my notes. And I'll actually, you know what, I'll write that down over here. So we'll write questions that are unanswered, and we'll write patents. I've actually, I've actually had to go through the patent process myself. So uh, if there isn't a section that I'm going to be covering, then I will just write one in. That's no problem at all. So I would, I would love to cover that. I would love to cover that. And in the context of this course, it makes a lot of sense to do so because we can cover intellectual property. Intellectual property and what that means for a business. Okay. Ah, choosing a legal form of an organization. That's where we were. Okay. So there's a couple of legal forms for your organization, right? The reality is, and this is the truth that nobody tells you, the IRS and the government and all the bureaus that are responsible for regulations are not going to run after you for starting a business before you do this. As a matter of fact, you can do this like a year or two after you're operational, right? You shouldn't do this if you've already pocketed like a million dollars from your business and you haven't reported any taxes because you've been operating in a gray area, right? But the reality is, a lot of entrepreneurs get caught up in going through these, this legal process. And we'll talk about when you should and when you shouldn't do it, but sometimes it's okay, especially if you're doing it individually, to skip out on it until you start pulling in some money, until you start pulling in some revenue, right? Because while your idea is developing, while you're doing everything else, unless you're involving other people, right? If you're doing it yourself, you can just do it yourself. But as long as you're involving other people, you are gonna wanna do this and we'll talk about why, and it's really to protect you from liability. Right, so protect you from liability and to make sure that every person gets their share of the pie, right? So the first organization we have, or structure that we have, is a sole proprietorship. Is a sole proprietorship. And that's exactly the kind of business that you would build if you were on your own, right? There's one owner, and you have unlimited liability for what happens with your business. So if you decide to start a sole proprietorship that manufactures baseball bats, you just wanna be a whole, like you just, you go and you chop down the wood in your backyard and then you shape it into beautiful baseball bats and you sell them on the market. And then the baseball bat breaks by some fault of yours and you get sued by a person that bought it, they can't only go after your business. They can also go after your home. They can go after your car. They can go after your bank account, your savings account, the stuff that you have in your house, anything that was promised to you, any assets that you have, they will chase you down. And what that is, is unlimited liability. Unlimited liability. So that's a sole proprietorship. Right. There's not many of these businesses, but most businesses start out in this form. Right. Most businesses start out de facto in this form because you're not doing it in any other way. Right. And you just can't. You might not be able to afford or think that it's necessary to do anything else. Right. Oh. The next thing is a partnership. Now, for a partnership, there's going to be a couple of caveats. Right. But on the basic level, it's two or more people. two or more people working together and they all share unlimited liability. Unlimited liability. 
And so, same case scenario, if you're all building baseball bats together, then that's what would happen. Yeah, people are way too litigious to be comfortable with that. Yeah, I, I agree with you. There's, there's very few situations in which you actually want a partnership or a sole proprietorship as your main source of business, especially today. Now, it is important to cover them because that's just how some things work out, right? But yeah, you're right. I think having the unlimited liability is very, very dangerous unless you, your company has a very big amount of money or you're insured, right? So if you're insured for liability, maybe you could pull that off. Always look at LLC or S Corp. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll actually cover those in a moment here. Um, but before before we get into LLCs and S Corps, um, where you know I think I think it's important to cover a couple of things about partnerships, and that's because whenever you pick people for your management team, unless you're directly paying them, they're essentially partners in your business, right? Even if it's not legally the case, they can be partners in your business in terms of execution and everything else, right? So. If you'd like right now, just put in the chat some attributes that are important for a partner, for a business partner. And I'll let the delay or anything catch up, but just any attributes that you consider to be important, right? So if you're going out looking for a partner for your business, right? What would you consider to be important? Because it's going to play a role in how you choose all of the people for your business, especially the people in management and everywhere else, right? So when I was thinking about this, some of the things I thought about, well, some of the things I thought about were the following. So capability was a big one, right? You can have a lot of other things, but if you're incapable of doing the job, then that's not really necessary, right? Then everything else doesn't really matter, right? The second thing that's important is compatibility. You don't want someone that you're going to be continuously fighting over every single penny, over every single thing with, because that's going to slow down your ability to make decisions. And the next thing you want to consider is honesty. Right. And those are the three characteristics that kind of dominate overall when selecting someone for a partnership. So having seen these characteristics, right, what you'll find is that compatibility and honesty are probably the two more difficult ones. Finding someone with the right capabilities is a lot easier nowadays. Right? So what you may be tempted to do is to turn to your friends and family. So on this note, I will say, I have started a business with one of my friends. Actually, I have started three companies with one of my friends. And I have started two companies with my family. None of which have gotten in the way of my companies. My companies failed and had various problems for different reasons, but none of them were because I worked with friends or I worked with family. However, I was always cautious. I was always cautious in creating contracts and in protecting the business and in protecting our relationship, right? And that's what you need to consider, right? So when you bring your friends into your business, you may think, well, he's my friend, I trust him, or she's my friend, I trust her, right? So, you know, or she's my sister and she's awesome and I trust her with, for the rest of my life. Why would I need a contract? Well, the reality is businesses are going to have problems, right? And some of the problems are positive problems. They're good problems. Like uh, you have to split a billion dollars, okay? Now, people tend to get kind of greedy when it's a billion dollars, right? Or a, a million dollars or $500,000 or you have to liquidate the business or one person wants to leave or stay because of family issues or health, right? And so you put all that in a contract in order to protect your personal relationship. in order to protect your personal relationship, right? So to protect your personal relationship, always err on the side of caution with friends and family. I'm not saying don't go into business with them. And you know, I'm not saying that you have to follow my example. My example is perhaps unique in a lot of ways, but doing that is very important. So the next thing you're gonna wanna 
brainstorm in terms of partnerships and just hiring people in general is going to be how do you test drive a relationship? How do you test drive a relationship with someone, right? How do you find out if things work? And so if you guys would like, just take a minute to put that in the chat. Um, and while you do that, I'll write down some things that you should consider in partnership agreements on the board so that we can go over them when you're done. Divorce, yes. Okay, divorce is, is a one way. I mean, I guess, I guess if you find a good business partner, you could marry them and be in a relationship with them and start, have kids and everything else and then decide that you wish to have a divorce. Um, but <clears throat> that's actually on the right track because that's actually on the right track uh, because dating works, right? Dating works. There's a reason people do dating. Um, and dating tends to work. And so what you want to do is you want to take your potential business partner out on some dates. Right? Go have some coffee. Go have some lunch. Go have some dinner. Go to a movie. Go to a show. And one of the things that I actually thought about when I was doing this, and this is probably because I'm doing this on Twitch, is competitive games. Right? So if the two of you happen to play a similar genre of games at least, right? or you, know, you could take just first person shooters. Most people understand those, right? and you play some games that are very competitive, you're going to actually find out some things about that person that are going to, that they may try to hide from you otherwise, right? And that's actually pretty interesting, right? So this is one I just thought of. I don't know how, how bulletproof this is, but if you're into gaming and, and your business partners are into gaming, you can go do that, right? So we as a company at Neighbor actually used to play Diablo 3, right? We love playing Diablo 3 together. We also played lots of Overwatch. So you tend to learn a lot about a person when you play games with them. Oh, very clever. Yeah. Okay. So if you're going into a business with family, you might want to think about divorce. That's very true. Right? So you're right. So one of the things, some of the things you want to have in your partnership agreement is you want to be, have ways to address death. You want to have ways to address dilution. You want to have ways to address bringing in additional partners, ways to address conflict resolution. How are you going to resolve your conflicts? And divorces or any kind of other relationship related things that are going to have or could have a negative effect on the business, right? And you want to be both specific and flexible. And what that means is you want to have specific solutions to an array of problems. Right? So, you, so in that case, that's very true, right? So if somebody gets divorced, the other person can buy the business for a dollar. You could expand that to, if, you know, family relationships result in tension and so on and so forth, and people are leaving or coming in or whatever, that's specific, right? I'm sorry, that's flexible, but the solution is specific, that another partner could just buy a part of the business for a dollar. So that's a very good one. That's a very, very good one. Yeah, that's actually, that's, that's a very nifty solution, right? You're absolutely right. That is a very nifty solution to that problem. So that's going to be partnerships, right? Another thing you can consider is the C-Corp, right? It's the C-Corp. Now, the C-Corp is its own legal entity, right? So there's no personal liability. Right? It's also preferred for investors, right? So investors prefer a C-Corp. 
And the reason is C-Corps tend to be a lot more transparent than things like LLCs, right? Now, there are some downsides, right? One, you'll probably have to hire a lawyer. I've seen websites where you can make a C-Corp, right? But I hired a lawyer because it was my first time doing it at the time. Um, I actually founded uh, the C-Corp in Delaware, where corporate taxes are lower, and then operated as a foreign entity within New York, right? Because I had an out-of-state corporation certification, right? Yes, and absolutely, you do require, yes, so you have to pay taxes, right? The C-Corp is not a pass-through organization, so you don't get your money directly and then just put it on your personal taxes like you would a sole proprietorship. Um, you would actually need to, need to pay your own taxes, right? There's also startup costs, so initial costs involved in doing a C-Corp. But, or... In summary, right, so you look at all these things and then you think, okay, but how about ownership, right? So how does it work with ownership, right? And the way you're going to do it is you're going to do it by distributing shares, right? So this was actually something that, that I had to stop and think about for some time. And, and let's, let's clear up the board so we can think about this, right? But we had to distribute shares. And when we distributed shares, we had kind of long-term plans for the company. We thought that it was going to grow, that it was going to be quite big and so on and so forth. And we thought that, and we actually did, end up compensating people in shares, right? And so what we ended up finding was the first thing we did is we authorized 10 billion shares, right? And there's a good reason for that. So we authorized 10 billion, right? But we only took out, we only issued 1 billion. So 9 billion were in reserve at the company for use for funding and dilution and everything else so we wouldn't have to reissue, right? And so we had the 1 billion, and the reason we did that, right, and we split up only about 300 million about amongst ourselves. And we left the rest for contractors and anyone else that would take our shares, investors, early friends and family funding, and so on and so forth. And the reason is, if you hire a marketing executive and they used to make you know $150,000, $200,000 a year, and they come home and they're like, yeah, honey, you know, they're giving me 15 shares of the company, so I'm actually gonna take this job and give up my, my income, right? Now, that's okay, right? That's okay, but your spouse is going to be a lot happier, at least psychologically, if you come home and say that they're giving me 150 million shares of the company, right? Because in their head, the math says, well, if there's 15 shares and, you know, shares are worth like a dollar or ten dollars each, that's not a lot of money. But if there's 15 million, there's a lot more, right? And that's just a small psychological trick and just a trick that we, we kind of ended up employing and, and that actually had some really good results when we started the C-Corp, right? Oh, and so finally, the C-Corp also files its own taxes, right? Files its own taxes. And you're going to do this on a quarterly basis. On a quarterly basis. Right? So you're going to need to hire somebody to do that. Um, unless, uh, unless your business is very, very simple. But usually it's good to hire someone to do that so that you pay less taxes. Right? Usually when you, when you hire somebody, that is a tax deductible expense for you. Right? So, for example, <coughs> excuse me, if you owe $1,000 in taxes... and you hire someone for $100 to do your tax forms, you can deduct the $100 from your taxes, right? So it's kind of like paying it forward, but it's just a better thing to do to hire a professional, right? And so besides the C-Corp, which is perhaps the, the, the most representative, if not in quantity, at least in overall value, right? There are some specialized forms of organizations, right? There are some specialized forms. And these specialized forms are going to include limited partnerships. Limited partnerships, right? So the reason you'd use this is, for example, you decide to go into business with your father-in-law, 
And your father-in-law says, you know, I'm, I'm willing to go into this business. I'm very, very busy. So I'm not going to be able to help you with anything. I'm not going to be able to help you with any decisions. But I'd like to be a partner in the business. And so I'll provide the capital and you provide the work. And that's how we'll work it out based on some division of capital and work, right, of how we're going to split the money. And so these considered a limited partner, right? So they have the same privileges as someone in a partnership in terms of sharing the money and in terms of paying their taxes individually. However, they have no liability. They are exempt from liability because they're not on the ground making decisions for the company. Right. The next thing is an S-Corp. S-Corp is, is what you mentioned in the chat there, um, but it's like a C-Corp for liabilities. Right? So the liability is entirely on the corporation. Right? However, your taxes are done as though you're in a partnership. So the money passes through the organization and into your personal taxes. Right? And this is one of the reasons that partnerships have become so unpopular and so have sole proprietorships because these other vehicles are just so much more effective. Right? So partnership tax. Right? This also allows you to pay dividends to partners without being taxed twice. Right. But I will say my personal experience with S Corps is rather limited. So if you're thinking about starting an S Corp, definitely talk to an attorney. Okay. The next thing is an LLC, right? Which literally stands for Limited Liability Corporation, right? And it's kind of the best of both worlds, right? So you have limited liability. You pass through the income. Pass through the income. Oh, the other limitation with an S Corp is you can't have more than 100 partners. Right? You can't have more than 100 partners. Limited liability, you pass through the income, right? Um, and you have an unlimited amount of partners. Infinite partners. Right? And so this is the predominant vehicle. This is actually a very recent invention. If you ask me for the exact year, I couldn't tell you, but. LLCs were not around for a long time, but a lot of people are forming LLCs even around their personal assets because it basically behaves like personal assets, uh, but shields you personally from liability or shields your assets from your liability. Man, this eraser is terrible. Um, shields your assets from liability. Speaking of which, if any of you are thinking of getting a blackboard and need an eraser, paper towel. Just, just a regular paper towel is working way better than the official eraser. All right. Um, there's going to be two more. There's going to be a professional corporation. Professional corp. Right. And so this is going to be for people like doctors or lawyers or anyone else that has um, a specific licensure to do what they do, right? Accountants, attorneys, whatever it is that you do. If you're a professional, you can open one of these corporations. Now what it does is it still has a limited liability for you, but only for your actions. So basically you're responsible for your piece. Right? You're in the circle and everyone else is in this bigger circle. So anything that these other people do can't impact you. However, what you do can impact you. And so anything that you do can't impact them, right? So liability doesn't flow in through the circles, right? It's specific to staying within the circles, but allows people to pool resources and pool opportunities for a professional corporation. You often find doctors doing this where they'll open one medical office, right? My, I mean, the medical office that I go to in particular does this, right? There's all kinds of specialists from different places all in one building so you get to go there and just have everything looked at at the same time they all take the same insurances they're all available at the same hours they all book through the same reception desk however um, if I go to a surgeon and that surgeon leaves some instruments in my stomach um, it's gonna hurt a lot and they're not gonna be responsible so you know the 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 gynecologist that's sitting in the office across from him is not going to be responsible for what the surgeon does, at least from a liability perspective. It will make the office look bad, however. Yeah, yeah, erasers, erasers work for about a week. Yeah, I found, I found one day was, was the limit on my eraser. 
Um, and then finally, you have nonprofits. Uh, nonprofits have all kinds of cool things. Uh, so my stream is actually a nonprofit, uh, or it's it's organized as a nonprofit, right? So I serve some kind of civic, educational, charitable, or religious purpose. Um, I must stay true to my mission, right? So when I declare a mission, like I wish to bring higher, you know, access to higher education to the world, right? I have to stay true to that mission. So if I'm, you know, buying Volkswagens by the truckload, there better be a very good educational reason that I'm doing that. Um, and then finally, any kind of donations are tax deductible to the donors, right? Donations are tax deductible. And this is actually really important and really cool because it allows it allows for the separation of two things. So with most businesses, your customers are the people financially supporting your business, right? With a 501c3 nonprofit, the people that need your service and the people that pay for it can be different. And this allows you to serve people without the means to pay for what they need, right? Which is actually very, very interesting. And, a great opportunity. All right. Those are your different specialized forms of, of different organizations, right? And so you're going to want to think about, right? You're going to want to take a minute just now while I prepare to think about how you would structure your corporation and how how your partners would agree to structure your corpor corporation, right? So, or not corporation necessarily, your business, right? So. If anybody that comes into your business decides, okay, well, I, I want a piece of this business, if you have a very rigid structure, you're a sole proprietorship, that's going to be very difficult to do outside of salary, right? So you should probably found a C-Corp, right? So you need to be thinking about several steps into the future, what you're going to need, right? And remember that there is some flexibility. So you're able to switch between like LLCs and C-Corps, but there are tax implications. There are tax implications that, are, that might be very costly. How does it work with DBA doing business as those aren't separate companies correct for liability no doing business as doing business as is just um, is, is going to be the exact same thing as the sole proprietorship right um, there may be some requirements sole proprietor or some kind of partnership structure, probably a limited partnership structure, but there's going to be requirements, right? So for example, if you're doing business as, I don't know, let's say a doctor, you might need liability insurance to be able to say that, right? Or a veterinarian, you might need insurance of, of you know, a million dollar or $5 million policy in case you get sued. Um, but I actually, I actually don't, I don't know all the, all the actual legal restrictions. So I'd be happy to look into that because I haven't, I, I didn't, I, it wasn't mentioned in my text and that's something that doing business as, let me write that down, doing business as, All right. but I'll look into that and I'll make sure to put it on the next lecture. Okay. The next thing that you're going to want to do for your business in order to succeed is forming strategic alliances. And this is by far the coolest sounding part of this lesson. Uh, because alliances just sound cool. Right? If you're forming alliances, it sounds like you're going to war or going on some great war path, right? Um, but actually it's a it's a pretty short section, right? So a lot of times you'll see large corporations forming these alliances. Large corporations. Right. And most recently what we've actually seen is that a large corporation, right? will find a bunch of small businesses that supply them with products, right? And what they'll do is the small businesses send products, but what the large corporations send out besides cash is they send out data. They'll send out data. And what they'll do is they'll say, okay, we'll buy a certain volume from you, but you have to custom tailor your products to fit our customers' needs, right? And so, these are usually difficult alliances, right? So another thing is if you decide to distribute a product as part of your business. So when I started my lock company, um, when I started my lock company, 
what happened was we found a lock that was aftermarket that was very good. So we said, hey, we'll sell your lock to a brand new demographic. We can reach these people. We can get to them. We can get them to use it. You guys you have to give us a better price, right? And they actually refused to do it, which was fine. Um, we ended up developing our own lock, which was like, you know, a, a one fifteenth of the cost uh, because hardware is disastrously overpriced. But that was the reality, and that's what we ended up doing, right? Um, when you think about forming with alliances with large corporations, remember that large corporations have very strict rules that they usually have to follow internally. And so what they might do is they might be limiting to what you can do, right? So you need to understand your kind of pros and cons, and you need to weigh them very effectively. You need to weigh them very, very effectively, right? So for example, if I decide to partner for my stream with Pearson, right? So let's say Pearson is a big textbook publisher. Let's say I, pub I, I partner with Pearson, but Pearson says, you can't do any board work, you can only do slides. Or if you do slides, you only have to do our slides. Or if you do any textbooks, they have to be textbooks published by us. And in exchange, we'll send you free textbooks. That's great and all, but I like the freedom to be able to use different textbooks, right? Actually, so I'm transitioning as much as I can, speaking of textbooks, to, and I, this is just a good moment to mention this, but I'm transmissioning, uh, transmissioning, transitioning as fast as I can to open source textbooks. So actually my personal finance lecture is based on an open source textbook. So if you wanted to go and look it up, the PDF is easily available, you just download it and you can read the book. Um, and I want to do that as much as possible and I want to start finding a way to contribute to these open source textbooks where it's, where it's missing information um, in order to kind of allow for the education to be completely free and as robust a way as possible, right? Um, what you'll find also is that you can have small business alliances. Small business alliance. Small business alliances, right? And these are going to be much more common. These are going to be much, much more common, right? So a lot of times what you'll do is, is you know, you'll have a business, for example, that sells empanadas. The guy down the street cooks chicken all day. Right? You're able to use chicken that was cooked the day before because you have to freeze it and process it and everything else. So you say to him, hey, all of your extra chicken I'll take. Right? Now a similar example is actually with McDonald's french fries. Um, and you know, McDonald's french fries are actually reprocessed into Pringles. Right? But, and that's not a small business alliance, but it is an alliance of sorts. Right? So you're going to want to look at different things that you can do. A lot of times what you'll find is you and another business will share the same customers but fulfill different needs, right? And so they'll go to one company for hosting, for example, for hosting of their website, right? or I guess they'd go to web development first. So they go to a web development company, and then the web development company says, well, I've got a great place that you can host this content, right? Um, another small business alliance that you can look at uh, from the perspective of my stream is recently Queens College uh, or the City University of New York agreed that for next semester some of my lectures are going to be broadcast on Twitch to actual students enrolled in the university, um, which is pretty awesome, right? I don't know how restrictive that's going to be. I've yet to look up any contracts and see how they do things, uh, but I may find out in the near future that that's the thing that I will need to do. And, you know, I'm looking forward to that in a lot of ways. So you're going to want to build small business alliances in order to help each other grow. What little DBA I've seen has been a C Corp doing business under another name. I gather it's just a way to rebrand without changing the existing corp name. Oh, it just saves you on the forms. Okay, that's actually really interesting. That's actually really interesting. Yeah, so that's something that's something I didn't know. I was certain that doing business doing business as had to do with a professional designation, but that's good to know, and that's something that, you know, I'd like to cover. So I'm actually I don't know if I can um if I can mod people in my chat very easily from what I have open here. Okay, let's see. Let's see if I can mod. Skullcrusher, thank you very much for your contributions so far. 
Same thing with Uncle Bull Druin. Okay, so you guys are now modded. Slayer Darth, in terms of Small Business Alliance, I work for a small web design agency and we tend to partner up with designers. We don't have the capacity to do the design work ourselves. And that's exactly, that's exactly the kind of stuff that you're doing, right? So basically you could have a client come in, right? And you can be any kind of business, but you could have a client come in and you could realize that you may not have the resources now. So let's say your client requires you to have 15 people from different designations, right? And you currently have six. Now you understand that this is kind of a unusual occurrence. You're not going to be able to hire and sustain another nine people. And so what you could do is you could go out and you could find a few designers or a few other people that can work together. Oh, lost my chalk. That could work together in order to fulfill this project, right? And that alliance could build into something greater over time. It could build into a greater relationship. But that's gonna be one of the most efficient and one of the best ways to grow your business. It's going to take some time to find the right alliances, but if you think critically, you'll be able to do it, right? So a couple of ways that you can get into these alliances is one, you're gonna to wanna to leverage your networks, right? We already talked about building networks and the importance of that, right? So, so you know, um, one of the ways that, that I found is very effective for networking is I'm on the uh, board of Lincoln Center. I'm on the board of the New York Botanical Garden and I'm on the board of the Natural History Museum. I also volunteer with two major educational organizations that work specifically within finance and if you've ever heard of it, the stock market game. And I end up meeting a lot of people there. Um, and I'm actually not on the full board. What I'm on is called the Young Patrons Board. Or the young board right and this is a, a group of people that are you know in their late 20s and early 30s that are looking to kind of contribute to a larger organization in a meaningful way and so you can look into kind of doing stuff like that so you're going to want to leverage your network you're going to want to identify contacts now this is kind of important right so you're going to want to try to find two groups of people when you identify contacts you're going to want to find the person that can make the decision that you need them to make right so the person that's going to be able to say, yes, we'd like to work with you, and the person that'll pick up the phone for you, right? So if you need Bill Gates to do something, Bill Gates is probably not the best way to get to him, right? There's probably another person that's going to be able to pick up the phone and discuss your opportunity and then get it to Bill Gates, who can actually make the decision, right? So keep that in mind because not everybody has the time to be filtering through every single little opportunity that's out there, right? You're gonna wanna do your homework. Do your homework. And this isn't specifically related to this class, right? Because I don't assign homework, but you're gonna to wanna to do your homework on the business that you're approaching, right? You're gonna to wanna to know what they do, you're gonna to wanna to know how they do it, and you're gonna to wanna to know where a lot of their work comes from, right? You're gonna to wanna to know where a lot of their work comes from, and you're gonna to wanna to know about things that they're involved in, past projects and stuff, such stuff as that. Okay, so, and then finally, you're gonna to wanna to monitor progress. Monitor progress. And what that means is you wanna see how well the two organizations work together, right? That's gonna be very important. And finally, in order to make an alliance work in the long term, is you're gonna to wanna to communicate. Right, you're gonna to wanna to keep the other person informed. When you form an alliance with another business, it's almost going to feel as though they are your employee and you are their employee, right? That's how much you're going to have to communicate with that business because you never want the relationship to become one-sided. If it does, the alliance will fall apart, right? You're always looking, always, always, always looking for a win-win, right? So when you have a proposal for another business, make sure that you are both winning in the agreement and winning significantly and that you're not profiting off of some mistake or some horrible thing that they're doing and so on and so forth, right? And then obviously, you know, if you have some ethical concerns, don't go into the alliance. It's better to steer clear of people that are unethical in business than it is to make a couple bucks off of their lack of ethics, right? Um, and we're finding that more and more, but that's more of a personal qualm that's going to be kind of important to individuals is, you know, 
I mean, it's great that your friend can get you really cheap cacao beans, but the fact that they're made with slave labor is probably not good, right? For those of you that don't get the reference, I'm actually talking about Nestle, who recently got in trouble for quite a bit of slave labor in their supply chain. All right. The next thing we're going to talk about after forming strategic alliances is the board of directors. So making the most of a board of directors. Making the most and I'm going to write it as BOD because I have a feeling we're going to be writing board of directors very often and so it's better perhaps to shorten it. So first and foremost I always work with alliances. I always think a decision always needs to come down to one person. I'm okay hiring a group for a project, but I want them in and then out. Hey, so, all right, let's, let's address that for a moment. You can decide that with an alliance on a decision. And usually the person with the decision is going to be the person with the client or the person with the need that's being filled by the other alliance, right? You can decide things like performance. Right? And it's actually very good. It's actually very good that you're skeptical, right? That you're skeptical because trust is going to be the most important thing. And, you know, personally, I tend to trust skeptical people because they tend to demand trust in return. Um, but you can agree on kind of performance. You can agree on everything else, but you're right in identifying a risk. You are identifying a risk in the alliance. So. When you hire someone, when they're in and out, if they do a bad job, you have some way of holding them responsible for that. You still have to explain it to your client and it still sucks, but you can't hold them responsible. But in an alliance, it's much more difficult, right? And this is why your alliance should not be built overnight, right? It should take some time from the start of your alliance to when you start working together, right? So don't run out looking for an alliance when you need it. You can start looking for potential alliances way before you need them and then activate them when you do need them. And that's one of the ways that you can mitigate that risk. But you're absolutely correct in identifying that risk. There is an absolute risk to alliances. Decisions get weird. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. That's 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 been my experience in alliances as well. However, it, my my field my field of expertise is kind of limited, right? So so this is kind of more relevant in different business sectors than it is perhaps in mine. Um, and but oftentimes alliances are a great way to grow your company. So but there is that trade-off, and and that's very good that you identified that risk because you should factor it in when you're agreeing to an alliance, right? Okay, so your board of directors will serve as the governing body. Now, most companies don't have a board of directors unless they have a legal requirement to have one, right? And so, you know, I have, I have a board of directors for this stream. Uh, I can't say that I'm following my own advice and all the things that I should be doing, but I'm trying my best, right? So, the legal requirements might be that your, your corporation has a board of directors and that they meet to sign the documents and so on and so forth. Um, and in that case, you'll do it, right? So let's think about for a second, if you could have a board of directors, right? Who would you have on it, right? Who would you have on your, your board of directors, right? So you'd want someone to supplement knowledge that you have, right? You'd want someone that can supplement experience. You would also be looking for someone that supplements in decision making. Someone that is a strong decision maker and someone that can advise on important decisions. Right? So you want someone that can give you advice. And this is the one way I've actually found boards to be critical. Right? Knowledge is good, but usually you can reach out to someone without having a board unless you're asking them all the time. Experience is great if you need something specific like how to raise money or something like that. Um, decisions, I tend to try not to delegate for as long as I can in my companies. Uh, so and I, I imagine most people are like that. 
but advice is critical, right? I've had several situations where I've picked up the phone and called a board member at 1.30 in the morning because I was tearing my hair out. See, it's all gone. I was tearing my hair out over a decision um, and they were able to give me the advice that I needed in order to one, get some sleep, but two, recover from what I thought was an impassable piece in my business. So that, that cornerstone of advice is actually very, very, very important. And so finally, um, you're gonna want to leverage your board's personal contacts. So for large companies, boards tend to be made up of very well-connected people in government, in the public sector, in the private sector, in different companies, and so on and so forth. You may find people that are very well connected within a specific industry or within a specific discipline. And so you're going to want to leverage that to your advantage if you decide to build a board. The alternative to building a board is building an advisory council. Is building an advisory council. And that's effectively what my board in the past has done, right? My board in the past hasn't really gone out and said, well, the corporation needs this, the corporation needs this. Unless you're talking about my most recent company um, from which I got fired uh, by my board. So that was a different story. And we'll go into the details of how gruesome that can be to build a company for, for several years and then just be thrown out by a couple of people. Uh, but that's the reality and sometimes that does happen. But if you build an advisory council, which most of you will be building for your business, these are people that don't necessarily need to be compensated. You can keep them interested with some percentage of the company, right? But they make no decisions and they're simply there to advise. And so naturally you're going to have some of these people on your team, right? Uh, your cousin or your uncle is going to be interested in doing something. Um, but the advisory council is perhaps a better way to build unless you're legally required to have a board of directors. Um, like a nonprofit is. Members of the board aren't paid. Members of the board are paid. They're paid like $12,000 a year for most companies. They can be unpaid. Um, most public companies are $36,000 per year. Um, some public companies are astronomical in their pay, depending on who they want as a board member. But uh, you you cannot pay them like you can decide not to pay them, but they have to agree to obviously work with you Yeah, it's organization dependent. That's probably the, 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 sh the shortest answer is that it's organization dependent All right, so That's your board of directors usually going to play a smaller role early on in your business and so shouldn't be much of your concern at this time, unless you, you know, the, the, the important thing here with boards of directors, with management, with everything that we discussed with forming your corporation is to think of the future, but not over prepare, right? Don't go out and build your business as though it's going to scale to 10,000 people tomorrow, right? Because that's, that's going to be wasteful of resources, right? Don't go out and hire a crazy expensive board of very successful people, and then you're the only person actually working at the company, right? Because you're not going to be able to leverage those people. So make sure that your human resources are scaling with your actual resources um, rather than scaling ahead of time. And so just as a quick review of what we covered, right? We went over the management team characteristics. We run over the management team, who that comprises of, how you should find those people, what to think of. We talked about the legal forms of organizations and how to select amongst those forms, right? And their unique features is the way I have it listed in my notes. We also talked about strategic alliances. And finally, we talked about the board of directors or the advisory council. Board of directors. All right. So that's what we had to cover 
for human resources. Okay, so before we move on, if you guys have any questions about what we just covered, put it in the chat. Um, I'm looking for some cool, cool bots or cool ideas for, for how to kind of change chat interaction to be more class-like or maybe more specific to what I'm doing. Um, and I've looked into a couple of different ideas, so we'll see what happens there. I'm going to go ahead, I'm gonna take a two minute break just to kind of get some water, get some fresh air, stretch a little, and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna discuss choosing a location for your business. All right, we are back. If you made it this far, thank you very much. 
Uh, if you're not currently following the stream, make sure you follow it to get notifications. I also post it on my Twitter, which you can find below. And um, yeah, thank you so much for watching. So let's jump into location. Uh, if you guys don't mind, just before you leave, or you know, before we even proceed, honestly, uh, do do me a favor and just write a little bit about. If you've done this before, you don't need to do it again. But write a little bit about why you're watching the lecture, what you're trying to gain from it. Are you trying to learn something? Um, are you trying to start a business? Are you do you have a running business and you're looking to learn more? So just just your general objective because it helps me tailor the lesson a little bit uh, to the different people that are watching. Okay, so. What does everyone say is the most important aspect of real estate, right? So no matter who you talk to, they'll tell you there's three things that are important about real estate. And the three things are location, location, and of course, location, right? That's what you hear as the common knowledge. Having worked in real estate for a very large part of my life, I will say those are not the only three things that matter, uh, but it's also important for your business, right? Your location is going to matter a lot for your business. So consider your business, right? Consider your business, consider what you're doing. Do you need to have an office space? Do you need to have retail space? Can you work from home, right? Think about what the business needs are, so just so that you can apply it better as we go through the lecture. Just love learning, hey, that's awesome. I love learning too. So that's really great. Um, okay, so if you have a brick and mortar startup, and this means that you need a physical location for what you're doing, right? This is generally referred to now as a retail space for selling something, right? Uh, but in general, this refers to just about anything that you need, right? You're gonna wanna think about some important aspects. Right, so I'm gonna list some important aspects on the board and if you guys want, list some things that are important about the physical location of what you're doing in the chat, and I'll add it to the board. I'll add it to our to our understanding, right? Some of the ones I got are your neighbor mix, right? So what is your neighborhood made up of? Where you're located? Who are the people? What other kinds of businesses are around there? Um, what things are working and, and how things work, right? So you want to think about your neighbors because if you're going to be getting into the business of selling high-end retail bags, for example, and the only things around you are dive bars, you're probably not going to be very successful, right? If on the other hand, you're building a dive bar and you want to build it on Fifth Avenue next to luxury retail, you're probably not going to be successful either. So you're going to want to think about the type of neighbors and the type of neighborhood that you're in, right? The next thing you want to think about is security, right? What is the security of your neighborhood? Is it a safe neighborhood, right? Are there opportunities for you to do things um, and protect your investments, right? Let's see. Oh. Services. So for services, you're gonna wanna think about government services. So do they pick up the trash? Is it easy to wire electricity and plumbing and all of those things to your location? Because if you're gonna have to figure out those things on your own, if you're gonna have to figure out garbage disposal and installing septic tanks, that's gonna add considerably to your cost. On the other hand, you may get a discount on your taxes. The next thing is you're gonna think about past tenants, right? So unless you're in a newly constructed area, someone was there before. And you're gonna think about who it was and why they failed. So if you're trying to open a convenience store and the previous convenience store was 7-Eleven that was in that location, and 7-Eleven failed to make a profit there, it's very unlikely unless you really differentiate yourself from 7-Eleven in a lot of aspects and really tailor your needs that you're going to be able to do that. And then finally, you're gonna to wanna to think about life cycle. 
And a life cycle is going to refer to your neighborhood. So is it a neighborhood that's growing, where more people are moving in? Maybe it's a neighborhood that's gentrifying. Maybe it's a neighborhood that recently received a lot of grants for arts foundations, and people are starting to flock in, right? You're going to want to think about the life cycle of your specific neighborhood and how that's going to impact your business going into the future. Your ability to deliver due to our office space. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're regularly hosting clients, having a nice clean office is ideal. Yeah. So that's another great thing to consider. So you're going to want to consider your image. You're going to want to consider your image, right? So if your clients are coming in and you're sitting somewhere in a basement, that might be a problem, right? However, if your clients are coming in and you have an opportunity to have them, you know, sit down in a nice clean office and everything else, they're going to assume certain things, just like your first appearances are assumed, right? So if you greet them in flip-flops, and a Hawaiian t-shirt, you better be selling vacations, right? Because if you're not selling vacations, your image is going to reflect poorly on you, right? Or Hawaiian t-shirts, I guess, or flip-flops. Um, but those are some of the things you're gonna wanna think about. Are there any first impressions? Yep. Exactly, exactly. So how are you going to go ahead and deliver on something that I need if you can't even take care of your own office space, right? It shows your level of devotion as well. It shows your level of devotion. So if your office is tidy and organized and everything is nice, you're going to expect tidy, organized work. That's absolutely correct. So the next thing you're going to want to also think about is customer accessibility. Now, most of the retail space that you're able to rent or buy is already going to be ADA compliant, which means that it's going to be... Uh, comply with the America's Disability Act, right? So you're only gonna have ramps and parking and stuff like that. But what if you're located on a busy street where there's rarely any parking and most of your customers commute by car? It's gonna be very difficult for them to get in, right? What if most of your customers are located in Manhattan, but you're located somewhere in upstate New York? Sure, you'll be able to service some of them, but it might be better if you had a great proximity to them. Right, if you were close by. So you're gonna to wanna to think about your customer accessibility, right? Who are your customers, how are they getting there, and how are they able to get to your services, right? Because if you're regularly hosting customers and you force them to travel a very long way and then find parking, your services better make up for that extra cost that they have to deal with. The next thing is you wanna think about your business environment your business environment. And what that means is the following. What that means is you're gonna to wanna to consider your tax. You're gonna to wanna to consider rents in the area, right? Your location. You're also gonna to wanna to consider traffic, right? Are people even able to get to you easily or do they have to take two bridges, right? And finally, you're gonna to wanna to consider zoning. Right? This is going to be important from a legal standpoint because you're going to need the appropriate zoning if you want to build some kind of brick and mortar building. Right, So if you want to say, hey, oh, I want to open a kindergarten, your zoning better allow you to open a kindergarten where you're doing it. Otherwise, you're going to run into trouble with the city right? and they may shut you down. Absolutely. Parking space is going to be a massive piece of what you do right? if you're able to afford to make that, right? But a lot of locations in places like New York City are not. So maybe what you could offer is you could offer validation for a nearby parking lot, right? So you have to come up with a creative solution for that. Um, yeah, absolutely. So co-working spaces have been increasing a lot and that's because a lot of people work from home, right? Another thing, another trend that I've observed and I actually worked with a startup for a short time that was doing this um, is virtual office space, is a virtual office. And there's actually a big push for this in the legal environment. So basically, right, the thing that they banked on is that most lawyers can do their work remotely. But you still have to meet clients. You still have to meet clients. 
right? And importantly, your address matters. So what this company would do is they would get a fantastic address, like one Wall Street, right? Which would, you know, you could put on your business card. And if you had to take a client there, you could take a client there based on a special scheduling. And you would be the only one in that office. So your client could assume that this was your office, where meanwhile, most of the time, you're working remotely or from home. The next thing you're going to want to consider is the availability of resources. Is the availability of resources. So for example, in some parts of New York, it's actually very difficult to get truck deliveries because they don't want trucks on the road all the time stopping to make deliveries and jamming up traffic, right? So you're going to want to consider your access to things like raw materials. Another thing that you're going to be worried about is your access to labor, right? So if you're located nearby a university where a lot of grads tend to stay in the city, that's gonna be a great opportunity to hire great labor. If you're located somewhere out in the sticks, it might be more difficult to hire someone that has an MBA or a PhD or anything like that because they tend to congregate around the university, right? This is the reason certain places are now trying to become tech hubs by building first tech universities and then trying to invite innovative companies and therefore attract talent to come and move there. And then finally, you're gonna to wanna to think about the availability of transportation, right? And this is pretty straightforward, basically, if you're right outside a train stop or a bus stop, it's going to be a lot easier to get to you than if I, the only way to get there is driving, right? If the only way to get there is driving through, you know, mud and dirt, that's going to be even worse, unless that's normal in your business, in which case you can consider it. But the availability of those kinds of resources is going to make a difference in where you decide to locate your business. Hey, hey, thank you for a raid of Pocket Patrol. We are actually just going over um, location. So all of you guys, welcome in. We'll be talking about some, some business needs. Make sure, you know, if this is your first time, I lecture on Twitch. Uh, I do all kinds of business lectures and, well, business lectures really. We go into economics and finance. We'll be introducing things like case studies. Uh, and one of the things we're working on now the most is getting chat involved and getting people involved and kind of participating and interacting with the lectures. So we've slowed down the pace pretty significantly so that everybody can be in here. So Alpaca Patrol, thank you very much. You are a champion, my friend. I love you, Rob. Okay, next. So after you think about the availability of resources, when deciding to build a brick and mortar business, right? You're gonna to wanna to consider things like personal preference. So just to catch everyone up that was here, we are going through the process of starting your own company. And as we go through this process of starting your own company, you have to make certain decisions. So the decision we're talking about today is a decision of where you're going to be based, right? So I myself am based virtually, actually out of my home. Um, other people that, that work on Twitch follow kind of the same regimen, but some people choose to have an office space, right? If your business involves doing other things, you may choose to have a retail space. So your personal preference is going to be a large part of, or is going to compose a large part of your decision about where you're going to work, right? Where you enjoy working, where it's comfortable, um, and the image that you'd like to put on. So for example, working from home, has some upsides and some downsides. The upside is your commute is zero. You wake up and you're already at work. It's great. The downside is that you wake up at work. So you're constantly thinking about working because 
I mean, you're basically at your job all the time, right? And so that tends to affect your work-life balance. Work-life balance, right? Because if you're constantly taking time away from your regular life to go and do work, that's going to be very difficult, right? And it's going to get you into some, some basic issues. And then finally, and what some people have brought up in the chat, Yeah, we did. We did actually get an overlay video. Oh, we got a cheer. Hey, thank you for cheering. Meepin' doofer. Thank you very much. Um, so, what you're going to want to think about is availability. Obviously, if you're selling clothes, you'd like to be on Fifth Avenue, right? Obviously, if you're a tech company, you'd love to be in Silicon Valley, right? Um, there's just going to be certain things that you prefer to do on a regular basis. However, that's not always available. And it's not, and usually isn't, within your budget, right? So the opportunity to actually go and have a space like this isn't there. And so the development of co-working spaces, and you can think of um, co-working spaces. For those of you that, that don't know, right? Co-working spaces are large offices that have several desks. And what you can do is you can rent just a desk, right? You can rent a specific desk or you can just rent a space in the office and it's first come, first serve, right? And so the big example of that recently is WeWork, right? And WeWork introduces this kind of flexibility because sometimes you need to meet a client or sometimes you want to show your friends how great your office is or sometimes you need some work-life balance and you need to get out of your tiny studio apartment where you work all the time and go work and socialize with other people that are also starting companies or doing something, right? The other thing to look at is business incubators. Incubators. And business incubators are the following, right? For those of you that are located in New York, um, you know, necessary plug, Queens College, the university where I work, actually has a business incubator. And what a business incubator does is it functions like a co-working space, right? So it functions like co-working office space. <laughs> I, just, I just processed it after I read it. What is the boats and hose stage? That's gonna be the last chapter. That's, good. That's gonna be, you know, you follow this lecture, you go through all this, you start a business, you become super rich, and then you invite me over on your boat for hose. That's that's when that happens. Um, so, so it functions like a co-working space, right? We're talking about incubators. It functions like a co-working space, and what you do with the co-working space is, did I just write? Well, I wrote it a little weird, but what you do with the co-working space is you have, um, you have, an office environment, right? So you have a basic office environment where you're able to go ahead and do your work and everything else. But you also have certain tools available to you. And what those tools are is you'll have computer access, you'll have 3D printers, you'll have scanning machines, you'll have a presentation room. You'll have access a lot of times for an incubator in a university, you'll have access to interns undergraduates that are willing to work for free, right? And so you'll have access to all of these components of building a business. And for that reason, it's called a business incubator because it's meant to take you from that very first step up until the point where you're ready to leave and have your own office. If that's what you choose to do. A lot of people keep running it out of incubators, but over time it's going to get cheaper to actually have your own space. So, the next thing to think about, once you've kind of decided that, okay, well, you know, specifically, I'd like to build a brick and mortar space, right? Or I'd like to work from home, right? Or I'd like to get something that I need, right? Or I'd like to work, um, excuse me, I'd like to work at a remote office location, right? So let's say I only go to the office when I have clients or when I have someone to meet, right? And so you're going to want to think about designing your facility. designing facility, right? And so the important thing in designing your facility is actually that it's applicable even if you don't go and open up a store, right? So if you go and open up just a base store, 
you'll have to design how people go through it and everything else. But if you have a home office, there's an element of design there as well. And that element is going to be actually very important, right? Because you're gonna to wanna to set things up to make yourself the most productive, right? So for example, right? If you stream on Twitch, you're going to have to have cameras set up. You're going to need lighting. You're going to need a microphone. You're going to need some kind of soundproofing and other things, right? So you're going to be thinking about all these things about how you set up an office. So it's important to remember, so the majority of the time what you'll have is you'll have special use equipment, right? Or special equipment. And when you're building a business, you're going to want to think about how you get to that special equipment because you're not always able to have the very best way to wait. It's currently a race happening outside. Um, you're not gonna, you're not gonna think about, okay, let me just buy a professional grade everything day one, right? That's very rare. The majority of the time, you're gonna have some kind of game plan to getting there. And that's actually very important. So the next thing is resist the urge to scale. Urge to scale, right? Which means the following. It means if you buy a location for a business, if you have it in your home office, whatever it is, resist the urge to set it up as though you have 20 people working there. Resist the urge to set it up as though you have 2,000 customers. Buy only enough space for what you need right now. And if you're unsure, that's no problem. Go with a smaller space. Customers will deal with a more crowded space because it'll look more interesting and more exciting, much better than they'll deal with a huge open space that no one is in because that'll make it look empty and it'll bleed you dry as far as your budget. And then finally, you want to think of just basic office equipment, right? Where are you getting your inevitable fax machine, right? It seems like there's like five companies left that use a fax machine and they'll always tell you, hey, could you please, could you please fax it to us, right? So where are you going to get your office equipment? How are you going to set up your copy machines? And most importantly, what do you need? And then finally, when you're designing all this, think about your business image. Think about your business image, right? So, you know, when you take the stream into consideration, for example, I used to have whiteboards. Now I have a blackboard. The blackboard, I think, looks a lot better on camera, which is great, right? If it didn't look better on camera, then I'd have made a step backwards in image, right? Hopefully in the future, we'll have better cameras and better lights and better everything. Right? And that will improve the image of, our, of my business. Right? For other people and for other businesses, it's going to be different factors that change that image. And that's going to be important for you to consider when you're starting a company. The next thing to talk about is the home business. Now, for most people, this is just going to be the reality of their budget when they start out. If they're going to be working from home, they're going to have a business. Right? So, if you guys can think of any... Put down some advantages and disadvantages of home businesses in the chat. Um, and I'll write out a few considerations. So in the meantime. Okay. All right. So, some of the considerations for your home business. Your first is going to be financial, right? You're already paying the rent or you already own your home or you already own your apartment. So, it doesn't cost you anything else to set up your home business there, right? That's a pretty nice thing. You don't have to buy a separate computer, a separate printer, a separate television, a separate anything else because you already have it. Proximity, that's actually going to be a very big one. Yeah, proximity is very important. Access to much more powerful computers. Okay, so specialist equipment. This is a minus. Special equipment. Okay, that's another great example, right? So. Your first is going to be a financial consideration. The next one is going to be your lifestyle, right? And your lifestyle means what's your starting point in terms of your home business, right? So if you already live in a cramped, tiny studio apartment in New York, 
your lifestyle is probably not going to allow you to build a home business, right? It's just going to be way too cramped and way too difficult, right? If you have a separate space or a separate large bedroom where you could set up all of your equipment, that's fantastic. The next thing is your image. If you have to regularly meet clients, that's going to have an impact on what you do, right? If you have to regularly have investors over, or if you have to have even friends over for your personal life, and then you end up with this problem that you've got this horrible, horrible mess of wires and computers and nonsense everywhere, right? And then people come over and they're like, well, I mean, there's not really a place to stand anymore, right? So you're gonna to wanna to think about your image. You're also gonna to wanna to think about the legal consequences, okay? And what that means is if you're starting some kind of internet company or something that's happening remotely, legal consequences are okay, you could probably do this from home. If you are, however, a practicing surgeon, practicing in your basement is not okay, right? It's not okay at all. So, you know, and, and you probably had very difficult time finding customers uh, in that situation. Although with the current state of healthcare, maybe the opposite is true. Maybe it'll be easier to find customers. Um, the next thing is you're gonna think about work-life balance, right? If your work is constantly what you do, anyway, then you already don't have any work-life balance. If work-life balance is important to you and spending time with your family and seeing your friends and so on and so forth, then you're gonna to wanna to see and make sure that it doesn't interfere with your daily life. Furthermore, you're gonna to wanna to consider your available space and does it suit your needs, right? That's an important piece. It might not suit your needs. You might have a lot of space, but it might not be good space for what you're doing. Finally, or I should say second of all, you should consider proximity. So how far away are you from other businesses, right? If you're very, very far away from other businesses, you're going to have a lot of trouble with proximity because if you need access to them, that's gonna be difficult. However, if you're in a place, let's say you're doing computer repair, right? If you're in a place surrounded by people that are in the older demographic that don't fix their own computers in your neighborhood, why in the world would you get an office somewhere far away? Right, if you could just as easily fix your computer here and you're close to your customers. A possible problem with setting up a home business is you might need special equipment, right? You might need access to things that you simply can't have on a home basis, right? Things that take up too much physical space or things like uh, compressed oxygen or you know, you know, open flames and things such as that that are going to require special equipment that you simply just can't have in your home, right? Or if you did, it would be extremely dangerous, right? That's an important thing to consider. You shouldn't convert my basement to an operating room. Yep, yeah, mm, okay, so I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it. <laughs> what I'm saying is that you might run into legal trouble if you do it, right? However, you know, I mean, we might run into a future where discount basement surgery is the way that we do healthcare. And if that's the case, then that's the case. I mean, so I, in no way, in no way will I ever discourage you from doing something. Um, I encourage you to try whatever it is you think is worth trying. But I will say that, you know, be, be prepared for a lot of legal issues. A lot of legal issues. All right. The next kind of business you can set up if you're not based out of your home, and, and in this case, you're probably based out of your home, but we'll leave that ambiguous, right? Is your location on the internet? Is your location online, okay? So if your business is located online, right, there's a couple of different things you could do. You could build an e-commerce site, right, and I mean, if you live at all in the modern era of the world, you've probably dealt with some kind of um, with some kind of e-commerce site. So the first kind you'll find is a business to business e-commerce site and that's Alibaba, right? So those of you that aren't familiar with Alibaba, you can basically go online and buy directly from manufacturers, right? Usually you'll have to buy like a quarter ton of something but you could buy it directly from manufacturers. And so this has been a very successful business and one that other businesses are starting to take advantage of. So if I can buy what I need directly from a manufacturer and I'm able to then resell it to a consumer by repackaging it and making it look nice, that can be a very profitable business. So when you're selling it to the consumer, what you're doing is B2C, which is business to consumer, right? And that's something like Amazon. 
right? Amazon predominantly doesn't sell to businesses, it does sell to individuals, right? And that's B2C. The other, fi the final point is auction sites. Auction sites like eBay, right? Or eBay, however you spell it correctly, lowercase and capital, but eBay, and, and this was actually something, the only reason I actually put it in here was because I, I know an interesting stat. eBay sells $2,000 worth of goods per second. That's their average pace of sales, is $2,000 worth of goods per second. So if you think about that, and eBay tends to charge a percentage, like 5% of what they sell, eBay is making quite a bit of money over second, every second. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for posting that. So I am looking for topics that you're interested. Um, if you're here to learn, I'm looking for the reasons that you're here to learn. and. Kind of trying to tailor my lecture to that. So if there's anything in business uh, that you'd like to know, please do let me know. Also, this might be a good time to cover this, but in the future, we'll be integrating case studies. And for case studies, what we'll be doing is we'll be going over a case together, uh, something like De Beers Diamonds, right? De Beers Diamonds is one of the biggest diamond producers and, and retailers in the world. Um, and what happened when synth synthetic diamonds hit the market and really exploded, right? So how does that business react? What is the background of their story? Where are their base? And, and we'll walk through a lot of their decisions and, and kind of the background that goes into that, right? So, and the goal of case studies is to put the learning into perspective. So we're gonna look at scenarios and then we're gonna learn to the scenario, right? So we're gonna start at the scenario, right? Then we're going to identify all of the missing bits of knowledge that we have. So for example, we need to know stuff about strategy. We need to know stuff about the diamond market, diamonds, and then we need to know something about basic economics, right? And so what we'll do is we'll cover these strategies, we'll, I mean, excuse me, we'll cover these topics, and then we'll return and come up with a solution for the scenario. So that's another thing. But if you guys have topics that you're interested in, if you guys have businesses that you're interested in, do let me know for sure. Uh, and I would be happy to look at that. And so, oh, obviously, besides being transaction-based, you can also do like blogging and streaming and produce content um, of some sort on the internet as a business, right? So that's, I think, I think that goes without saying, considering we're all on Twitch. And so one of the things you want to consider when you're starting a company and when you're starting, when you're choosing your location is whether or not you're going to be part-time, right? So this is one of those things that I, I, I tend not to recommend um, unless you just want to kind of dip your toes, right? Because this is the equivalent of dipping your toes, okay? If your goal is to become a swimmer, dipping your toes isn't going to make you a swimmer. If your goal is to find out the water temperature, this is an all right way to do it. So I'm not saying take the plunge right away. What I'm saying is dip your toes, see how it feels, see if it feels right, see if you're on the right track, and then jump in, right? And so that's going to be an important consideration for what you're doing. So let's do a quick review of this section and see what we covered. So we talked about locating brick and mortar. We also talked about design and equipment and the impact that that can have on your business image. We also talked about home-based home-based companies, right? And then finally, on setting up on the internet and some of the pros and cons of doing that. So, Having said that, I'd like to say that for today, the lecture is concluded. Um, if you haven't followed the stream already, please do so. Uh, I also have a Twitter where I regularly write things like streaming now. And I have a YouTube where I regularly post chopped up versions of these streams as VOD so that you can catch up on what you're doing. Um, yeah, also, Towards the end of the lecture, I like to cover any questions that people have, stream or not stream, business or not business related, uh, and you know I'd be happy to do that today. So take a minute or two to kind of write something in, 
see if you have any questions, see if you'd like to know anything else, and I'd be happy to cover that.